no pressure there. Good messages for the past year and a half, and now me. It is a unique opportunity to be able to be here on the final Sunday of special speakers for your pastor will be here next Sunday and I rejoice with you in that exciting news. And so I can only say only greater things are on the horizon. And so I'm sure God's going to bless you and them tremendously. When I was asked to come this morning to speak, I was told that it was Communion Sunday and if I would have a problem doing that. And I said, absolutely not. Uh, what a privilege to bring everyone before the communion table. But I also realized that sometimes we take this opportunity a little blasé. It doesn't have the importance in our hearts that it should as to what it represents. Jesus asked that we do this until he returns. And I don't know how you feel, but I feel that's probably going to be right around the corner. So uh, this morning I wanted my message to take and encourage you. Who our Lord Jesus Christ is, who he should be to each and every one of us, who he is to God the Father, what responsibilities fall into his lap? And what a privilege it is to come into his house on this day to worship together in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I've been told to tell you this is an open communion. It's, you don't have to be a member here to, be, to take part in it. But as I reminded congregations that I've been a part of in the past, you do need to be a believer in Jesus Christ to partake of this communion. For if you're not, then it's just a cup of juice and a piece of bread. But to a believer, it represents his broken body, his shed blood. And we make it personal, as whenever I read the scripture this morning, you'll find that this scripture was written in the personal, singular mode, which means it's, it wasn't a group of people, and I'm going to be taking you to Psalm 8 if you wanted to look it up. But it wasn't written uh, several people coming before the throne of God. It wasn't written as a challenge to a congregation as to a call of worship. It was written to men singularly, which means it was written to each and every one of us. And we need to take, and we have to keep it in mind as we take and come before his throne. How many of you have heard of J. Vern McGee? I've known a lot of people that have heard of him and said, oh yeah, I listen to him each week and he has a church out west somewhere and he's been dead for years. But he was one of my favorite commentaries to go to. He's actually more popular now than he was while he was alive. And you can listen to him on the radio multiple times every day. And it got to a point with me that when I read his commentaries, as I read the words, I could hear him standing behind me and hear his distinct voice with each word that I read. And it made it all the more important to me. I realize this is the way that we need to feel when we read God's scripture to us, that as we're reading these words, it's as if God the Father or Jesus the Son is standing right by us saying these words. Jesus was one of the all-time greatest speakers the world has ever known. The world is willing to accept him as a teacher, but not as a savior. And so you and I are a very special group of people that when Christ reached out to us, we said, yes, I want to become part of your family. 
Psalm number eight will lead us in the communion today. And it starts out with these words, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Does it say that your name is just one of many names? Because this world has a lot of different voices to it. You can get advice about anything. I don't get on Facebook very much, but when I do, I look and I see people that I know putting their whole life out on there. Problems that they're having, trials that they're having. And underneath that, I see one comment after another, after another, after another. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to go here, you need to go there. No one ever says, suck it up. Pull your boots up by the bootstraps. Or as my sister-in-law constantly tells me, put your big boy pants on. Our Lord Jesus Christ, his name is the most excellent name in all the earth. And that's his table that's sitting before me and you right now. When we were small, I was watching all the children here, and a little boy sitting over here kept eyeing me over there. I wasn't nervous until I saw that. And then I was glad to see him get up and go to children's church, because... <laughs> but you know, the Bible says we all need to become as children. We need to become as believing as little kids are, that takes everything at face value, that a child will put his hand in our hand and walk with us if they trust us, and how we need to be there for our children. So I commend your church, for junior church, for the children that God has put into your hands, and for the future that is before us. Psalm 8 is a messianic psalm. And it's called that because it is quoted many times in the New Testament. It's always in direct reference to Jesus Christ. In fact, he himself quoted it in Matthew 21. And so I'd like to take you there. Psalm 8, verse 1 which is a repeating of what I had just said. It says, a, a psalm of David, O Lord, our Lord. Not to be mistaken, whose Lord is it? It's our Lord. Your Lord, my Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Another version of the Bible says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. And I like that word majestic. To me, it just wraps itself around our Savior. What does it mean? It means it's over the top, the best, worthy to be praised, all-powerful. I one day, as each of you that are believers, will be able to go into heaven whether we're called home for whatever reason or we're called up in the end as he calls the whole church up to be with him in the clouds and we will see him for who he is. And then we will probably wish that we approach the communion table a little differently. Looking at it as to what it means to us for what he did for us. You know, I've had people in my church that as they approach death, their concern was that people would forget them. And it happens that as we pass away, no matter how prominent we are in this generation, in the next, they won't know who we were. And they'd say 
Pastor, will you remember me? And depending on who the person is, I'll remember some more than others. But I'll say, yes, I will remember you. And they'll say, whenever, whenever you do this, or go here, or, or, or something that we did together, will you remember me? Will you do that and remember me? And I say, sure. Some places in your mind, you close your eyes and you see the person that's passed on. That's how important this table is. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this until I come again. I often wonder sometimes, what will I be doing when the good Lord calls my name to take me home? Where will I be? It would be cool if I was serving communion or even taking communion to hear that trumpet blow feel those words, it's time to go home, to whip you up. But in Psalm 8, it sets in our mind how majestic, how majestic is our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been set thy glory above all the heavens. There is no one greater than Jesus. No one. Psalm 95, the first verse, it's not a call to worship. As we find Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2, it says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. That is said as a call to worship, to bring people into the mood of worshiping God. It's not a call of a congregation, as we find in Psalm 107, when it says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. This psalm directs us into the presence of God, the maker of heaven and earth. Hebrew 4, verses 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us come boldly in, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find the grace to help us in time of need. I'm looking at your faces here, and a lot of you are wondering, where is he going with this? What is he trying to get across to us? It's the fact that only you have the ability to approach God on his throne. And at that point, he will look at you as holy. And why is that? It's because Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and what we just read is he's majestic, has saved you through the shedding of his own blood, and you have accepted him as Savior. And in that, Christ is the door to our Heavenly Father. To those people that feel there are more than one door into heaven, I have a surprise for you. If there are, they're all locked. There is only one way into heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Only one. To those that think they could talk their way in, that their works are greater than anybody else's, and that will count for them, well, the Bible says our works are as of filthy rags. And the Bible also says that sin cannot come into the presence of God. So that means you and I, before Christ, were not permitted to come to, before God. 
but through Christ and his mercy and his grace and his sacrifice. We have been made holy in the sight of our God. And so when you leave here today after taking communion, I want you to realize that as far as God's concerned, you are a holy person. And we need to live our lives that way. And we need for our friends and family around us to look at us. And when they look at us, that they see God within us. But they don't, when we talk, that they don't hear just idle words. They hear the fact that we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this world, we need more and more people putting their faith out there for everybody to see. Because this country even though it's the greatest country in the world. While I was in the Air Force, I had the privilege of visiting and being stationed in several different countries, seeing several different cultures. And don't get me wrong, there are nice people, but there is only one United States of America. And this God-led country is number one in the world. And we need to act like it. In verse 2, when it says, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. This was a challenge to the chief priests and scribes who wanted children to be silent. That was one thing about when I was in full-time ministry. I didn't mind our kids being rowdy in church. I didn't mind being able to hear a baby crying in the back or a child singing the hymns right along with us and you wonder what page they're singing off of. Because we need to draw the children unto us as Christ did. And so when it says out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, it could be talking about children. Because it said in Matthew 21, it says, And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And he then said unto him, Hearest thou what they say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. They wanted the children to be quiet, and Christ wanted them to speak up. For they saw in him that which we are supposed to see in him. Now, babes could also mean new believers. And I imagine there are several new believers here. And boy, when you're a new believer, you got courage in the faith. I remember when Deb and I had gospel treasures. There was a little boy that came in the store all the time with his mother. I looked at him and he was a little John the Baptist. If you talked to him for more than two minutes, he tried to save you. He would start talking about Jesus and he wouldn't stop until you say, okay, I accept him. He was an example that we all need to have in our life. And that little boy came down with cancer and one day came in to tell us, God cured me. That little John the Baptist gave the glory to God. So babes could be new believers. In Luke 10, verse 21, it says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. God's word is not hard to understand, but it's not for everyone. You may read the Bible every day, And every time you read it, you'll come up with something different. But if everybody could understand it as it is written, then the world would have taken it and turned it inside out. But 
God has given the, the wisdom to us. The smartest people in the world. You believe that? No. I don't come close to being the smartest people in the world. Nor do you. But we take and accept it. The world looks at, looks at it as foolishness. How many people have ever given you a hard time for going to church? I remember going to picnics in different places and somebody would come up to me with a big smile and say, so what do you do for a living? So I'm a pastor. Are you still one? Yeah? I'm sorry. Sorry for what? That you're a pastor. The world look at us, looks at us like we're foolish, don't they? And yet his word, it says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confront the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confront the things which are mighty. If I had to classify all of us, us, all of us here, I would say we are weak individuals. We are not the strongest in the world. I don't see anyone here that's a bodybuilder that has muscles upon muscles or courage to withstand everything. But what I do see is weak people made strong in Jesus Christ. And in that, we are the strongest people in the world. For in our weakness, we find his strength. And in his strength, we realize he is alive and well today. In verse 3, when it says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. Boy, there's a lot of people looking up these days, isn't there? I look at YouTube, trying to find it a a video that's interesting to watch, and I'll see 10 or 15 in a row all about there's aliens. Your neighbor's an alien. Chances are you're an alien. They're here, they're gone, there could be, whatever. Deb says, what do you think about that? I said, I don't care. I don't care. When I look up, I don't look at distant planets and wonder what's there. I'm in awe, awe that God put each and every one where it's at and put them there for us to enjoy and to show us his might. The mystery as to what is out there, I leave to someone else. Our thoughts should be of the one who created all that we can see and all that we know. In verse 4 and 5, it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visits him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. What is man? That's been a question of all times. What is man? What are we all about? Why? What is our reason for being here? We can contemplate that, but as far as the Bible's concerned, we're here for one reason to worship God, to praise him. We are made in God's image. Do I believe that God is a 74-year-old guy that's bald? No. But I'm made in his image. I have the ability within me to have the love, concern, and a helpful nature for those around us. To love people, no matter where they're at or who they are, but to realize without Christ, their destiny is not a good one. Oh, I've had people come up to me in the past that all they wanted to do was argue. You're a Christian, aren't you? Yes, sir. I hear you're a pastor. Yes, sir. Well, I'm an atheist, and I don't believe anything you would say. I said, that's fine. 
What? Well, that's fine. See, the Bible tells me I'm not supposed to argue about those things because an argument means you get mad, and if you get mad, you lose control, and if you lose control, you're of no use to God. So it says, don't argue these things. And so what I'll do is I'll tell them, that's fine. Believe what you want. And actually, an atheist believes. He just believes there's no God. I said, believe what you want, but believe like your life depends on it. What do you mean? You'll find out. You'll find out. We are made in God's image to represent God till Christ returns, until he takes this earth back to reign. And then it says, and the Son of Man, that thou visits him. Son of Man. A lot of people think, well, they must be talking about Abraham in the garden. He can't be. Because Adam didn't have a father. He didn't have a dad. He was created by God. And so when it talks of the Son of Man, he is talking of Jesus. And when Jesus would refer to himself in the New Testament, he would always refer to himself, himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man. Made him a little lower than the angels and cast, hast crowned him with glory and honor. We need to realize that when Jesus came to earth, he was 100% man, 100% God. He allowed himself to be 100% man for one reason. To walk with us, to talk with us, to be there for us, to leave a message that we could rely on and find hope in. But his main purpose was to die. And as God, he can't die. But as man, he did. And he allowed them to take him to the cross. And they allow, he allowed them to torture him, to draw blood from him, to allow him hang there until the life seeped out of him, to go into the grave, and then to arise. Arise. No longer fully man, fully God. And God reached down to show the whole world who he was and took him home to where he sits at the right hand of the Father. Now I know that in heaven I believe there's no time. There's no clocks. There's nothing that sets out that days went by, or a week, a year, a hundred years, or a thousand years. To us, Jesus has been sitting there for a long time. He's waiting for one thing. God to say, stand up. What a day that's going to be. He will return, not as he did in the first time on the back of a burrow, showing compassion, the world looking at him as not having any strength or honor. But he will return as Almighty God. And he will treat this world as it should be until it once again looks back at him for who he is. Crowned made him a little lower than the angels. And he had to be to experience death. Verse 6 says, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All things will be put under God's feet. All enemies will be put under God's feet. He will judge all. The only problem is this hasn't happened yet. On his second return, he will rule until every enemy is under his feet. 
It talks about a thousand year reign that he will reign. I believe that at this time, this is when the church is with him. We've already been called up. Tribulation is already over. And now we rule with Jesus. And the whole world will take notice and come under his supervision. In verse 7 and 8, we look back and it, what it does is it takes inventory of the things that man was put in charge of while he was in the garden. For you feel, when we were in the garden, it was totally different before sin. And then we were fallen creatures afterwards. But it said we were, the original stewardship we had is that we were over all sheep, oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. We were to be over everything. And then sin. Someday we will be restored. And in verse 9, it ends as it started. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Or, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. We will be going to the communion table shortly. It is my desire that as you take of this, and we will have prayer for the bread and the cup, and we will give you an opportunity for silent prayer to make things right in your life that you should make right before you do this. Because that's what the Bible says. Make sure things are right in your life. If you need to go tell somebody you're sorry, do it. But it's not up to us to decide if you're right for this. That's between you and God. It's our opportunity to stand and to serve you. To accomplish what Jesus said we need to do. Do this in remembrance of me until I return. How many are looking forward to Jesus to return? Hey, you can clap, you can put your hands up, you can stand up and say hallelujah. If you've never thought about it, may today be the first day that you do. You have a new pastor on the way, or he may even be here. I don't know. He may even be sitting out here. I wouldn't know what he looked like. I have a favor to ask of you. Pray for him. Don't wait until he stands up here. Start now. Pray for him if he's on the way here. Good travels, safe travels for him and his family. If he's here, pray for his heart. Not physical, but spiritual. For it's a tremendous responsibility to be the shepherd of a church. And you are a wonderful church. And you deserve the best. And from what I hear, he's on his way but he's still responsible to someone else, to God. Not to you. He can't be responsible to you, only to God. He needs to choose his words, pick his sermons, sit down with those that need to talk, and go see those that, that need visited. He needs to spread himself so thin he doesn't know if he has enough strength for the next day. But he needs to get to know you, and you need to get to know him, and I want you to go out of your way to do that. But don't take him for granted. 
I've been in a pastor position now for almost 30 years. And an old pastor, the first day I went to take and be an interim pastor at a little church, an old pastor came up to me and he said, Brother, if there's anything else in the world you'd like to do, do it, other than being a pastor. It's the best of jobs, it's the worst of jobs, it's the easiest jobs, it's jobs that'll just make you shake, shake your head. But greater days are ahead because of the man you called to this church. And as we come to this table, I want you to say, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name that you, as you look at this and you hold these elements in your hand, you realize that it's the broken body of Christ. It is the shed blood of Christ, and he did it for you, for you. This is an important day. When they say this is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. It starts this month with this communion, and then your life goes through it. I tell everybody you cannot change the past, but you have total control over the future. Live your life for the one that died for you. As the men come forward, I would like for you to take the time to pray. Just a few moments. Prepare your heart for communion.